In this video, I'm going to be going over the Takedo software project. If you're a researcher in the field of quantum information, or if you're a student who's learning the subject for the first time, Takedo hopefully has something to offer you. If you're a researcher, there are a number of tools, utilities, and numerical optimizations that Takedo provides that are useful to pushing some of the results that you may be trying to pursue on your own for your own area of research in quantum information further. If you're a student who's trying to learn about quantum information and wish that you had a sandbox or some type of utility or tool to play with some of these abstract concepts, Takedo can hopefully offer this to you. So in this talk, I'm going to be going over the Takedo software package and going over some of the high level details uh, of what it can provide to you as either a researcher or a student. I want to extend my thanks as well to the Unitary Fund for supporting this project. They support a number of other projects in the quantum information space. I think they do a lot of good work and I'm very happy to be associated with them. So Takedo stands for Theory of Quantum Information Toolkit. It's an open source Python library that's useful for studying a number of very common objects that pop up in quantum information. A little bit more fine grained, it has tools for studying things like entanglement theory, non-local games, and quantum state distinguishability scenarios, some of which we'll touch on a little bit more in this talk. Another thing to mention about Takedo is that it's a bit more computer science focused and a little bit more physics focused. And this is really just nothing more than an artifact of my own academic upbringing. Having a background in computer science, I tend to approach subjects in more of a way that is palatable to a computer scientist. If you are of more of the per physics persuasion, perhaps you would benefit from other open source tools such as Qtip, which is also supported by the Unitary Fund that I highly recommend. So the way that I view quantum information, and it may be an oversimplification from the perspective of a computer scientist, is that I view quantum information as consisting of three primary objects. And quantum information to me consists of states, channels, and measurements. And to extend that analogy a bit further, I view states as the input to a program or data to be processed, channels as something to actually happen to the data that is put into the machine or the program, and then measurements are kind of the final readout or the final output of your uh, program, the thing that you run on your machine. The nice thing about these three objects is that all three of them can be encoded or described by matrices of a very specific form. Particularly, all three of those can be described by positive semidefinite matrices. The nice thing about that is there exists a optimization technique called semidefinite programming, which is very similar to the technique of linear programming, where one optimizes over linear constraints for a given problem. In the concept of semidefinite programming, it's the same type of idea, but you're now optimizing over positive semidefinite constraints. And it happens to be the case that there are a number of problems that pop up very frequently in the field of quantum information that lend themselves very nicely to this optimization technique. And you'll see this type of optimization technique all over the place in Takedo, where a number of quantum information problems are specified in this framework, and an open source software such as CVXPy is used to compute the actual convex optimization that goes on underneath the covers. So as was mentioned before, states, channels, and measurements constitute the core of what Takedo provides to its end user. And while I won't be able to go through all of the extensive operations or properties or particular types of states, channels, and measurements that are provided uh, in Takedo, you can check the documentation and the tutorials page, I will go through some of the very basic things that one can do, at least from the states level, just to kind of get a sense as to what one would expect what a very basic quantum information library would provide to them. So in this example, what we're doing is we're importing the Bell function, which is a very well-known and well-studied state in quantum information, and we're obtaining the zeroth index Bell state, which is given to us as a column vector. Mathematically, that's represented below this code sample. And the nice thing about the way in which Takedo processes information, both from an input and output standpoint, is that it's just dealing with NumPy arrays. And if you're familiar with Python and if you're familiar with NumPy, Hopefully the barrier to entry to including this in your own project or using it for your own purposes is low. And hopefully you can be effective in using this without having to understand too much about proprietary data types that are uh, an artifact of what Takeda provides. So in order to see some examples of some things that we can do with states, we're going to go ahead and create some corresponding density matrices of the Bell vectors. So I've just created these density matrices row zero and row one by constructing them from taking the zeroth and first index bell vectors and multiplying them by the conjugate transpose of the zeroth and first index bell vectors to create row zero and row one. And this is shown below the code sample. 
So we're just going to breeze through this part of it and just kind of showcase a number of basic usages or some things that one would expect that any general purpose quantum information library would be able to provide to them with states. So in this case, what we're doing is we're just computing the tensor product of row zero and row one. So we're storing the result of that in this variable sigma. Of course, you can take any number of vectors or matrices and pop them into the tensor product function to compute the tensor product. A very common operation that exists in, in quantum information is performing the partial trace, and that is just taking a subset of an overall quantum system. In this case, we're taking the sigma variable that we computed up above on line 12 and computing the partial trace on a specific number of subsystems, namely the first and third subsystem of this overall system. And we're also able to specify the uh, dimensions of each of the four subsystems of this particular state. Another common operation that also exists in quantum information is the partial transpose, which is used frequently for things like separability detection. And this, we're just computing the partial transpose on the state row zero. We can also check properties of states, whether or not state is entangled or pure uh, or separable. What we're doing here is we're checking whether or not the matrix, which again is represented by this row zero state, is pure or not. And we're getting the Boolean value true to indicate that it is indeed pure. There are also a number of metric functions, which are basically notions of distance for two given states. So in this case, what we're doing is we're computing one such metric function, the fidelity, on row zero and row one. But there are many other metric functions that are provided in Takedo, and again, I defer you to the documentation and tutorials page for more information on that. So now that we've seen some of the more basic and fundamental operations that one would expect in any quantum information library, we're going to go into some of the more unique things that make Takedo a little bit more um, individualized. And one of those things is how we can use this to study the subject of non-local games. So if you haven't seen what a non-local game is, I'll give a very brief crash course here, but I defer you, of course, to uh, other external sources for a much better overview of what these things actually are. But in short, a non-local game consists of at least two players, which we'll call Alice and Bob. And these players are expected to play cooperatively with each other. The catch is, of course, that Alice and Bob cannot communicate with each other once the game begins, but they're free to communicate prior to the game to establish a strategy that they will use to play the game. The players are going to be playing against a party known as the referee. The referee will just give questions to Alice and Bob, will expect answers back from them, and then will compute a predicate function, or a function that determines whether or not Alice and Bob win or lose the game based on some criteria that they all are aware of, and will tell them whether or not they win or lose. So putting all those pieces together, we have this non-local game image. On the far left, we have this R0, where R0 is sending X to Alice and Y to Bob, which are their respective questions. Of course, Alice doesn't know the question that Bob received and vice versa, as they cannot communicate at this point. Then Alice and Bob are expected to return with answers A and B, and those answers are sent back to the referee, who then computes whether or not they win or lose. Now, there's a very specific type of non-local game. There's a class, I should say, of non-local game called XOR games. And XOR games are a class of non-local games such that the winning condition is predicated on the XOR function. And we can see here, this is uh, the CHSH game, which is a specific type of XOR game. And the winning condition is given as this equation below. It indicates that the XOR of the answers that Alice and Bob return needs to be equal to the logical AND of the, of the questions that they receive. And if this condition is satisfied, we say that Alice and Bob win the game. The CHSH game is of particular interest and was studied under the context of Bell inequalities prior to it being uh, considered a non-local game. And the reason that it's an interesting uh, subject of study is because this illustrates a task or a non-local game where Alice and Bob, the players, can do strictly better if they invoke a strategy that is quantum, that is one that involves a shared state and sets of measurements, whereas if they just use a deterministic classical strategy, they can't do as well. So going to Takedo, we can actually specify any type of XOR game very simply by just specifying two pieces of information, namely the probability matrix, which we define on line five, and the predicate matrix, which we define on line eight. The probability matrix simply encodes the probabilities with which Alice and Bob get the questions. In the CHSH game, we assume that the questions are given with equal probability, and there are four possible question pairs, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. The predicate matrix is simply a matrix that indicates what the expected winning outcome for Alice and Bob should be in the case that they get a question pair. For instance, the top left entry in this matrix corresponds to the case where Alice and Bob get 0, 0 as a question, and the expected answer there should be Alice and Bob's response 
equaling zero. So AX or B needs to be equal to zero in that particular case, and so on for the other entries in this predicate matrix. Now one can specify an XOR game, any XOR game, using these two objects, and the way that we specified these particular two, they define the CHSH game, we pop those two matrices into this XOR game class and define an object called CHSH, which is just an object that we'll use to calculate both the classical and quantum value of this game. And we'll do that using Takedo directly. So one of the built-in functions that this object now has is classical value. And this gives us the optimal winning probability that Alice and Bob have if they invoke a classical strategy for this particular XOR game. We can see in the case of CHSH, the best that they can do if they use a classical strategy is winning with a probability of three-fourths. Alternatively, if they make use of a quantum strategy, they can actually win with a strictly higher probability. That is, they can win with a probability of cosine squared pi over 8, or a little bit more than 85%. A couple notes on this, XOR games and non-local games. Namely, the CHSH game, as I mentioned, is an XOR game, which is a subset of a non-local game. There are some very nice uh, results that correspond to directly calculating the quantum value of an XOR game, and that can be done directly through a very nice semi-definite programming formulation. This type of formulation does not necessarily exist for non-local games, it's not known to exist, and directly calcula calculating those values for a general class of non-local games is a very wide open and interesting field of research. There are a number of methods for bounding these quantities, and some of those methods are involved in Takedo, such as providing lower and upper bounds or providing non-signaling bounds on non-local games. But this is something that one researcher could use as a tool to understand these types of objects more deeply and intimately. Another setting that one can consider in Takedo is the setting of quantum state distinguishability. That's given by this image here. In this image, we again have Alice and Bob, and at the top we have the set eta, which is a collection of density operators or quantum states indexed from 1 to k. And from this set, there is a given state that is chosen at random, given to Alice and Bob. And Alice and Bob then need to figure out what state they were given, and they want to do that with the highest probability possible. And what they can do to perform this task is perform type, some type of measurement on their own portion of the subsystem that they hold, and depending on the type of measurement they have access to, they can succeed at this particular task with varying probabilities. And this image here is given a number of different classes of measurements that Alice and Bob can potentially use, and some of them are easier than others to determine the optimal probability of. Being able to do this is a very wide field of research in and of itself, and has very deep roots in the field of quantum information. So having numerical tools and an easy way to specify this landscape is very useful for pushing this particular field of research forward. In this case, what we have is we have a collection of states that we're defining here. We're just using this as an illustrative example. So we have a list states, which is just a list of the four Bell states. In this case, specified as vectors, but can also be specified as density operators. We also specify a list of probabilities. This is a list of probabilities that specifies with what probability are each of these states going to be selected from the ensemble. Given those two pieces of information, you can specify a quantum state distinguishability scenario and you can pop them into a number of functions that Takeda provides. For instance, what the optimal probability is for optimizing over global measurements, PPT measurements, and the more restrictive class of separable measurements, which is actually a hierarchy of semi-definite programs that eventually converges to the optimal value. So that's a very quick overview of some of the core features that Takedo offers. There are many others that are also on the GitHub website and documentation pages, which I encourage you to check out. If you're intrigued and like what you saw in this video, please give it a pip install, check it out. And if you have any questions or if you want a feature request or if you want to contribute to the project, I welcome all of that and I would be happy to discuss any of that with you further. Please reach out to me at any of the channels below and thank you again for watching.